بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. Okay, إن شاء الله we're going to look at now an introduction to ruqya. So now, بإذن الله تعالى, we're going to look at the more practical sides of these modules now. It's important to note that all of these previous modules which have gone before, these are extremely important. The knowledge that we have learnt and shared with one another, you need to hold on to this knowledge. And now we are going to look at some of the practical implications and implementation of this knowledge. So the knowledge of our aqidah, the knowledge that we've mentioned of, of sihar, the magic of amulets, the, the magic that we've mentioned with you know, the, the, sacrifi the sacrificial animals, the things that the magician does. We need to remember all of these things. We looked at the jinn, we looked at their creation, we looked at some of their, their, their abilities, we looked at those things which they don't have the ability to do. We looked at their weaknesses as well. We've looked at Ain, we've looked at the evil eye, we've looked at its reality. What is it? How does somebody, you know, how can we try and spot the differences between Ain and magic, magic and jinn possession, jinn possession and evil eye, etc. We've looked at these things, but again, it's extremely important to note, we are always learning. This is just a basic foundation knowledge. Basic foundation knowledge that each of us needs to know when we are performing Ruqya bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Now we're going to look at Ruqya. So what is Ruqya? Where is Ruqya? Is it mentioned in the Quran? Is it mentioned in the Sunnah? This word Ruqya. Where is Ruqya? Where do we find Ruqya? We find this word Ruqya, it is mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a hadith which is recorded by Imam al-Muslim. Awf ibn Malik, he said, radiallahu an, we used to recite Ruqyas, we used to recite Ruqyas during the Jahiliyyah. During the Jahiliyyah, we used to recite Ruqyas. And we said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what do you think of that? So before Islam came, the companions, they used to recite Ruqya. These Ruqa, these Duas, etc. They used to recite them. So they went to the Prophet Wasallam and they asked him, O oh Messenger of Allah, what do you think about that? What do you think about the fact that we used to recite these things? The Prophet Wasallam he said, recite your Ruqyas to me. What you used to recite, recite them to me. And then he said, alayhi salatu salam, there is nothing wrong with a ruqya that does not involve shirk. There is nothing wrong with a ruqya that does not involve shirk. And it's narrated from Jabir radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam forbade ruqya. So to close all of the doors, he forbade ruqya. Just like we had in the beginning times of Islam, the Messenger alayhi salam, he forbade the people from going to the graves. He forbade the people from going to the graves because they used to go there, they were new to Islam and perhaps they would fall into asking of the graves. So he forbade it and then later on he allowed it because it reminds you of the Akhirah etc. So Jabir radiallahu an, he says the Messenger of Allah forbade Ruqya. Then the family of Amr ibn Hazm, they came to the Messenger of Allah and said, O oh Messenger of Allah, we had a Ruqya that we used to recite for scorpion stings. We used to recite this Ruqya for scorpion stings, but you have forbidden Ruqya. Then they recited it to him. They recited this Ruqya which they used to have for scorpion stings. And then the Messenger alayhi salatu salam, he said, I do not see anything wrong with it. Whoever from among you can benefit his brother, then let him do so. So the Messenger alayhi salam, he allowed it. As long as it does not contain shirk, whoever can benefit his brother, let him do so. Another hadith which is in Sahih al-Bukhari, it's narrated in the authority of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala an. Some companions, and this is an important hadith which we're going to refer back to at a later time bi-idhnillah for some of the rulings. Can we charge for ruqya? Etc. We're going to refer back to this hadith. Some of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they came across a tribe among the tribes of the Arabs. And that tribe did not entertain them. So the companions, they are traveling and they stop at a tribe and they 
want this tribe to entertain them. They want to, you know, have some hospitality from this tribe, but they didn't do that. This tribe, they didn't treat the companions well. While they were in that state, the chief of that tribe, he was bitten by a snake or he was stung by a scorpion. So the chief of this tribe, which refuses to look after the companions, he is bitten by a snake or stung by a scorpion. So the, the people, they came and they said to the companions of the Prophet wasallam, Do you have any medicine with you or anybody who can treat with Rukya? Do you have any medicine or anybody who can treat with Rukya? So at this time, it is well known that the people would perform Rukya. Okay, that Rukya which would involve shirk, the Messenger alayhi salam, he did not allow it. So they came to the companion and said, do you people have any medicine or anyone who can treat with Rukya? The companions, they said, you refuse to entertain us, so we will not treat your chief unless you pay us for it. You refuse to entertain us, so now we're not going to treat him unless you pay us for it. So they agreed to pay them a flock of sheep. One of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, he started reciting Surah Al-Fatiha and gathering his saliva and then spitting where the snake had bitten or where the scorpion had stung. Simple Rukya Ya Ikhwan, simple Rukya. Just reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, he gathered his spit and then he, uh, spit, uh, he spat where the bite had taken place. The patient was cured and his people presented the sheep to them. But they said, we will not take it unless we ask the Prophet ﷺ whether it is lawful. So the companion said, we're not going to accept this payment until we know, is it lawful for us to accept this payment for what we have done? When they went to the Messenger ﷺ, he smiled and said, how did you know that Surah Al-Fatiha is a Ruqya? How did you know that Surah Al-Fatiha is a Ruqya? Take it and also assign a share for me. Take some of those, take the sheep, that, that payment that you have agreed, and then give me a portion of it as well. So from this, Ikhwan, what we can see as a broad definition, and our brother will probably you know, expand upon this, is that Ruqya, it is the recitation of Quran and du'as from the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, seeking a cure from illnesses sincerely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And Ruqya, it can be used for the treatment of magic, evil eye, jinn possession, and any other illness. Okay, we need to get this very clear. Ruqya is not just for jinn, magic, evil eye. Ruqya is for every single illness. The Quran, it is a shifa for every single condition. Every single condition. What's the proof for this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ We have sent down that, from, that of the Quran, which is a mercy and a shifa. It is a cure, a healing for the believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْئِضَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ O mankind, there has come to you from as instruction and warning from Allah and a healing for that which is in the breasts of men and a guidance and a mercy for the believers. So we use these ayat to prove that the Qur'an is a shifa. From beginning to end, this is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not going to bring you any harm. It's going to bring you benefit upon benefit. An important point to note here. People, they become scared. I don't want to recite Quran in case. I don't want to recite Quran because. I don't want to do this. Is it okay to recite Quran on him? Subhanallah. Do you think that reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring any harm in any way, shape or form? Rather, no. The Qur'an is only going to bring benefit upon benefit upon benefit. It's important to remember, Ya Ikhwan, this is one of the tricks of the shaitan and the shayateen when you will come into contact with them. They make you think that you are the one who is giving the cure. They will make you believe that there's something special about you. Remember the ayah that we mentioned, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicts you with some difficulty, there is none that can remove it except for Him. 
And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows something upon you, then who can prevent this? Who can prevent the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So it's extremely important to remember the shifa is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We recite, we take these actions, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who sends down the shifa upon whomsoever he wills. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he gave a beautiful example. He likened this example, he likened it, the Qur'an, to a huge sword. He likened the Qur'an to a huge sword. And he likened the arm. If there is a huge sword on the table, Ya Ikhwan, is it, use, is it useful? No. The sword in and of itself, no, it's not useful. And we're just using this example now to try and clarify something. The sword, if it's there, you need somebody to swing the sword. And the sword, the arm of the person, that is your Iman. That is your tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is how close your ruqya is to the sunnah. And we'll mention other things. But subhanallah, the Quran is a lethal, lethal weapon against the shayateen. You will lay waste against the shayateen. But if your Iman and your tawakkul and your yaqeen is not good enough, then you're not going to be able to use the Quran to its full ability. To its full effect rather. And you won't be able to lay waste to the shayateen like somebody who is doing it according to the sunnah, somebody who is completely relying, trusting upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With regards to this, with regards to tawheed, we've mentioned tawheed already. But we have different levels of completeness in our tawheed. And Ibn Uthaymeen, Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah, he mentions the first level is the level of a person who seeks for somebody else to perform ruqya upon him. This person, he seeks for other people to perform the ruqya upon him. And the Shaykh said, this person has missed out in completeness or perfection of Tawheed. Because he's gone to somebody else and he's asked them to recite over him. The second level is the one that does not stop someone from performing ruqya upon him. So he hasn't asked for it, but somebody comes and just begins to perform ruqya over this person. And the Shaykh uh, Rahimahullah, he said, this person has not missed out on completeness because he did not seek the ruqya, nor did he request it. So he didn't stop the person, but he didn't ask the person at the same time. So this person has not missed out on completeness and perfection of Tawheed. The third type is the person who prevents the one who performs ruqya upon him. The one, somebody comes and wants to perform ruqya over him, the person prevents him. And the shaykh, may Allah have mercy on him, he said, this is in opposition to the sunnah. That you stop the one who wants to help you, this is in opposition to the sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ did not prevent Aisha from performing ruqya upon him. And likewise, the companions, they did not prevent anyone from performing ruqya upon them because this doesn't affect your tawakkul. When the Prophet ﷺ became extremely ill, when he was unable, before it was his sunnah, before he slept, he used to cup his hands, he used to recite Surah Ikhlas three times, Falaq three times, Nas three times, blow into his hands and rub his hands over his body. When he became extremely ill, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she used to do this for him. But he never stopped her. We, he never stopped her. So she radiallahu anha used to do this, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never stopped her. We also need to mention now, perhaps there's some brothers here who have knowledge of this hadith of the 70,000 who will enter into Jannah and there is no hisab for them as we've mentioned. They don't even look at their deeds, they're not held to account for their deeds, they go straight into Jannah. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim and it's narrated by Ibn Abbas that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, 70,000 of my Ummah will enter paradise without being brought to account. They are the ones who do not ask for ruqya or believe in omens or use cauterization and they put their trust in their Lord. So an important thing now, we don't believe in omens, we don't go for cauterization, we put our trust in Allah. But what about this bit now? They don't ask for ruqya. 
Concerning this hadith, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah he said, this is because these people will enter paradise without being called to account because of the perfection of their tawheed. Therefore, he described them as people who did not ask others to perform ruqya on them. Hence, he said, and they put their trust in their Lord. It's due to their tawakkul in Allah. Because of their complete trust in their Lord, their contentment with Him, their faith in Him, their being pleased with Him, and they're seeking their needs from Him, they do not ask people for anything be it ruqya or anything else and they are not influenced by omens and superstitions that could prevent them from doing what they want to because superstition detracts from and weakens tawheed so ibn al-qayyim rahimahullah he's simply mentioning the completeness of their tawheed they go to jannah because subhanallah their tawheed is complete they completely trust in allah they don't believe in these silly omens they don't turn to anyone except for allah jalla wa ala as a result of that, they go into Jannah without any accountability. We mentioned that perhaps we are thinking, perhaps we are thinking here right now, this is 70,000. Subhanallah, how many scholars are there of Islam? How many companions were there? And me, how am I going to be within these 70,000? But we mentioned in other narrations, with each one of these 70,000, there will be 70,000 more. So each one of these people, he will take 70,000 other people with him. This is a huge number. And in another narration, which I believe is authentic, three handfuls of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Only Allah knows the great number of those people who will enter into Jannah bi ghayri hisab. So we need to do those steps. We need to take those steps, which means that we are not excluded from those people. The lajna, what they mention is, what is meant is that they do not ask others to perform ruqya for them or cauterize them. Rather, they put their trust in Allah and rely on Him to relieve their suffering and to ward off what harm would come to them and to bring that which would benefit them. So it's extremely important. I want to mention now, so we've established now, if you have the ability to do ruqya yourself, if you have the ability to do ruqya yourself, you should not ask for ruqya to be uh, performed upon you. But if somebody comes and they tell you, you come here and sit down, I want to perform ruqya on you. And you just listen and you come and sit down and they recite over you. You do not take yourself out of the fold of the 70,000. Why? Because you did not ask for it. You did not request it. Rather, that person told you to come and sit down and you recited. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah, he said about this, the phrase in the hadith about the 70,000 who will enter paradise without being called to account that they do not ask for ruqya means that they do not seek it from others. But the Prophet wasallam commanded us and taught us to seek treatment and he said Allah has not created any disease without also creating the cure. Some know it and some do not. So when we have an illness, the cure is out there. Some people know it, other people do not. It comes down upon whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. So seek treatment. Seek treatment for your cure. It's extremely important now we ask this question. What about the situation where the person, he cannot recite. He doesn't have the ability. When he opens the mushaf, he faints. Or when he opens the mushaf, the, the jinn, he clamps his uh, lips shut or his tongue twists or his tongue comes out to his chest how do we expect this person to recite and if this person requests ruqya now will he take himself out of the fold of the 70,000 subhanallah this is an in, this is an extremely like uh, question which we which we need to deal with because we might f find ourselves in this situation there may come a time, ya ikhwan, where the jinn, jinn will take control of the person's tongue. They may cause him to be disabled and he can't do ruqya. And that person, he doesn't want to ask for ruqya. He knows this hadith. He wants to put his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does not want to ask for ruqya. He'd rather be patient and deal with it. He'd rather face that trial seeking the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what about when it gets to a stage where this person can't even pray now? So he can't even f fulfill the obligatory actions that Allah has obliged him to do. In this situation, what we advise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best is that this per person, he should 
ask for Rukya. Or he should speak in such a way that he should make his problems known to a close friend of his, but he doesn't need to directly ask for Rukya. So he can mention some of his problems. Perhaps that brother bi idhnillahi ta'ala, he will get the hint and the brother will say, I'm taking you for Rukya. And when this happens, he shouldn't say no. He shouldn't say no. He is making his problems known and bi idhnillahi ta'ala, those close brothers who are practicing, they will perform the Rukya or take him to Araqi. He hasn't requested it. And again, as our brother Hafizullah, he mentions that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something infinite, it is something great. So if the person seeks treatment, but he was only doing it because he was in a situation where he had no alternative, he couldn't even pray, he couldn't worship Allah, then inshaAllah, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still include him within those 70,000 who enter into Jannah bi ghayri hisab. But the complete tawheed is that of self ruqya So this is why we always push self ruqya for the person who has ability and Allah knows best. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include us in those 70,000. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Continuing on from this topic It's very important that we understand that the rulings of Islam are multi-dimensional The rulings of Islam are particular to people's circumstances So yes, we encourage the brothers to recite upon themselves even when you go to Iraqi, we encourage you as a Raqi or as a person going to Iraqi to make yourself the primary reciter, to focus yourself upon the reading, to make it not that you go to the Raqi and you expect, you lie down and you say, Taib, do with me whatever you want and then you go home and you do nothing and then you come back and you say the same thing. Again, this is clearly weakening the person's Tawheed. As for the one who goes to the Raqi because he is in a desperate need, especially those whom the shaitan have, not, uh, have blocked their ability to recite, then this person, it may be an obligation for him to seek Rukia, especially if he has no alternative, if he can't find an, an option, then it may become an obligation for him, wajib upon him to seek Rukia. And in this case, he is not going to be punished by Allah Azza wa Jal or detracted from his status by Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala because he did something that is wajib. So distinguish between different situations. Furthermore, the last point that I wanted to make on this is do not confuse seeking ruqya with seeking advice. Seeking advice is something from the sunnah and it is a standard by which the Muslims are known. Brother, I've got a problem. I'm not feeling so good when the jinn does this. I feel like this or I feel unwell when the Quran is recited. Okay, come to me. I will read on you. That person did not seek ruqya. They simply sought advice and the advice of the Raqi was him to read and they took the advice. So this is as a Raqi, what you're trying to do is detract from people relying upon you besides Allah. And that for me has two very clear aspects. One of those aspects is that you're in the first place, you're getting people to recognize that their cure is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're encouraging them to recite upon themselves. You're encouraging people to go home and recite. You're encouraging them that the ruqya you're doing for them is minbab at ta'lim, from the point of educating them, from the point of instructing them. And when they learn how to do it, bismillah, off you go and do it on yourself. They usually will get to a point, as is the case for many of the people we see. A large majority get to the point where they have become overcome and they cannot recite. These people, it may be an obligation for them. In fact, it, as, as the, the fatwa of the Lajna and some of the members of the Lajna, Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, they indicate that it may be an obligation for them because Allah Azza wa Jal is going to ask them on the day of judgment, why didn't you pray? They say, I didn't pray because I wanted to be from the 70,000. No chance. I didn't pray because I didn't want to ask someone to help me. This is not, the, this is not anything at all from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first aspect, as we said, is you're encouraging people not to rely upon you as a person. In the second uh, aspect, in general, your, the, your, the, the way that you are present yourself to people, 
the way that you carry on your ruqya, the way that you advise people, your whole setup of how you find patients and how you treat them is based around people in being encouraged to rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Your setup, the way you bring people, you know, I do ruqya, come and seek help from me, come and ask me for help, come and, not like this, but advice. Someone comes to you and says, Akhi, look, I don't know what to do. I will advise you here, Akhi, tafaddal, this is my advice to you. Okay, my advice to you is that you perform ruqya. I'm unable to do so, okay? I will perform ruqya for you. This person has not sought anything from anyone other than Allah Azza wa Jal except the advice that Allah Azza wa Jal commands us to offer and seek in the Quran. They advise each other to the truth and they advise each other to patience. So hopefully this clarifies for people that we are constantly trying to Again, the job of the Raqi is what? The first job of the Raqi is a da'iyah. The first job of the Raqi is to call the people to tawheed. So your first principle is that you're trying to stop people from, tr from having a, a link to you with besides Allah Azza wa Jal. You're trying to stop people from relying upon you besides Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. We have a number of issues to cover now on the topic of Ruqya. Uh, as an introduction to the topic of Rukia before we go over the actual Rukia session and the Raqi as an individual. From the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he has revealed to us his Quran. The speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran that is in front of our eyes, that we can take it and read it whenever we want from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he has promised to protect this Qur'an. We sent down the remembrance and indeed we will guard it. And this is in uh, opposition or in contradiction to what was done to the previous umam, the previous nations. Who Allah Azza wa Jal as a test and a trial for them, He entrusted the safekeeping of His speech to them and His books and His scripture to them. And they failed in the task. But for the Muslims, from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is this Quran that He has sent. And consider this Quran, Ya Ikhwan, realize what is this Quran. سُيِّرَتْ بِهِ الْجِبَالِ أَوْ قُطِّعَتْ بِهِ الْأَرْضِ أَوْ كُلِّمَ بِهِ الْمَوْتَى If there was something that could move the mountains from its place, that could take a mountain and physically throw a mountain from its place, or could break the, uh, the earth up asunder, tr rip the earth into shreds, into pieces, or cause the dead to speak, it would be this Qur'an. Do not ever, ever, ever underestimate the power of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something azim, ya ikhwan. It's something that is a description, an attribute of Allah azza wa jal. If there was a Qur'an that could move the mountains or break up the earth or cause the dead to speak, it would be this Qur'an. And what does Allah azza wa jal say about the Qur'an? That if this Qur'an was sent upon a mountain, this mountain would have crumbled to dust. It would have been, I would have been humbled and it would have been rendered into nothing by the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal, broken up by the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This Quran, and the reason I'm saying this, Ya Ikhwan, is how many times do we hear people say, any this recitation of the Quran in Rukia. This is for the mubtadi'een, for the beginners. As for the ulama of Ruqya, they have their portions and they have their things and they no longer recite the Qur'an and they touch a person and they twist a person and they give him to drink and they give him to eat and he is cured bi idnillah. We say you got it the wrong way around. Are you saying to me that you're poking and prodding and the honey that you give someone is equal to a Qur'an that can move the mountains? It's not equal. And the only reason they are unsuccessful in their recitation of the Qur'an is because their aqidah about the Qur'an is wrong. Their belief about the Qur'an is wrong from the outset. They don't believe that this Qur'an can cure that patient without me feeding him something or to him something or doing something or talking to the jinn or 
you know, twisting his arms back. We're not saying these things aren't going to have a point. They are going to have a place in Ruqya. But the first and the foremost thing, the beginning and the end, the most important thing and the only thing that you have day after day and you carry it with you and you never fail to treat a patient except with this thing is this mercy of Allah, this speech of Allah, the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this Quran a cure. A cure that encompasses all sicknesses, physical and spiritual. It is a medicine for the heart and a medicine for the body. Listen to this, Yaikhwan. Seeking a cure from the Qur'an is from the perfection of your Tawheed. Why is seeking a cure from the Qur'an a perfection of your Iman and your Tawheed? This Qur'an is the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. It is the speech of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala uncreated in every single way. When you seek help from this Qur'an, you seek help from Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. This Qur'an, when you recite it for the purpose of curing yourself, this is from the kamal, the completeness of your Tawheed, and the perfection of your Tawheed, and the strength of your Iman, that you don't run to this and that and the other before the first thing that you run to and the first thing that you seek help from is the speech of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is especially important in these times of tribulations and trials. Ikhwan, the suffering that people are going through and the facade, the corruption that exists upon the earth. We've already covered some of the ayat and I just want to expand upon some of the ayat a little bit to talk about the Qur'an as a shifa. We heard the ayah from Surah Yunus. Ya ayyuhal nas qad ja'atkum maw'ilatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fis sudur wa hudam wa rahmatun lil mu'mineen. It is a medicine for the ignorance which resides in the hearts by which Allah cures the ignorance of the, ig the ignorant person such that they are relieved of their sickness and by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides whoever he wills from his creation. It is a clarification of the halal and the haram. It is a guide to what constitutes obedience and disobedience. It is a mercy upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows this mercy upon whoever he wills, Jalla Jalal. All of these things are taken from the books of Tafsir when they talk about this ayah. In the second ayah, In Surah Al-Isra, Ibn Kathir Rahimahullah, he says it's an admonition against immorality. It's a, it's a treatment against false doubts and notions and things. It's something which removes filth and impurity. By it, guidance and mercy from Allah can be achieved. And the guidance and mercy of the Quran is only for the believers about which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions what he mentions. And as Sa'di rahimahullah, he says, this Quran is a cure for what is in the breast whether illnesses or the desires which are uncontrolled by the limits of the Sharia or, Ill, or the illnesses of false notions which smear a person's certain knowledge. Since in the Quran there is exhortation and encouragement, warning and threat, a promise which causes the slave to hope and fear, to hope for good and to fear evil. And if found in a person, it necessitates that they put what Allah wants before what they want and what pleases Allah before what pleases them and the desires of their soul. Similarly, the proofs which are found in the Quran, which Allah has explained in the clearest way, they remove the false notions which smear the truth and take the heart to the highest levels of certainty. When the heart is healthy and free of illnesses, the limbs will follow since they are purified by its purification and corrupted by its corruption. Ibn Qayyim talks about the Qur'an as a cure. He says the Qur'an is the most complete cure from all physical and psychological illnesses. The illnesses of this world and the hereafter. Not everyone is capable or is given the success to seek a cure from it. If the sick person uses the proper method Number one, point number one in the speech of Ibn al-Qayyim, not everyone is given the tawfiq from Allah to use the Qur'an as a cure. 
Point number two, if the person uses the proper method of using it as a medicine with belief and faith and complete acceptance and firm belief in it as a cure and fulfills all of its conditions, no disease will ever overcome him. Look at what Ibn, look at the Tawheed, look at the Aqeedah. Look at what Ibn al-Qayyim says. If you fulfill its conditions and you do the, the, seek the cure in the right way and you perform it in the right way, no disease will ever afflict you. How can a disease overcome the speech of the Lord of the heavens and the earth? The speech which if it was sent upon a mountain would render it to dust and if it was sent upon the earth would break it up. There is no illness of the heart or the body except that the Quran contains the means to cure it, why it happens and how to protect for it, or protect from it for those whom Allah grants understanding of his book. As for the diseases of the heart, Allah mentions them in detail along with their causes and the method of curing them. So the one who is not cured by the Quran, may Allah not cure him. This is what I look at what Ibn Qayyim says. The one who doesn't find shifa in the Quran, May Allah not cure him. And the one who the Quran is not sufficient for him, may Allah never suffice him. This is the speech of Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah. The one who the Quran is not a cure for him, may Allah never cure him. Because if you can't find in your heart the ability to turn to the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal before you turn to Fulan and Alam, so and so and so and so, then may Allah not bring about a cure. This person doesn't deserve a cure and if Allah cures them, it's from His mercy that has no limit. And as for the one who Allah is not sufficient for them, may they never find sufficiency in anyone. This is what Ibn Qayyim says. As for the Quran being a cure, it is a cure from those things which are in the hearts and it is a cure for those things which are psychological and it is a cure for those things which are physical. It is a cure for the illnesses of the unseen and the illnesses which we can see in front of us. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the shifa in the Quran in a general sense. So in one ayah Allah says shifa'un lima fi sudur. And in another ayah He says وَنُنَزِّرُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ shifa. We send in the Quran, down in the Quran, i.e. the whole of the Quran. The whole of the Quran as the Mufassirun say. The, the, the min al-Qur'an here, the word min in the Qur'an is not tab'iliyya as they say. It isn't to separate part of the Qur'an from another part. When they say from the Qur'an, they mean the whole of, the, or Allah Azza wa is referring to the whole of the Qur'an. The whole of the Qur'an is a shifa for every single illness. Because in the ayah in Surah Al-Isra, the word is general. And when Allah Azza wa Jal mentions a word in a general sense, it is not to be restricted without evidence. And the evidence of the Sahaba and their actions, the agreement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the speech and the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a clear evidence that they understood the shifa of the Quran to be general for every illness. So they used it for scorpion stings and snake bites. And they used it for the evil eye. And they used it for the jinn and for magic. And they used it for their health and their sickness as Aisha radiallahu anha would blow upon the Prophet sallallahu when he had a fever and when he was sick. Subhanallah. You see from this the comprehensive nature of the cure of the Quran. If you're wondering, especially those people who are looking at this from a very scientific and a very medical point of view. And they're saying, what is it about the Quran? What is it about the Qur'an? Of course, us as, 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 as Muslims, we have this belief that the Qur'an is the speech of Allah and we hold it to, to be in its state and we know that the cure comes from it. But how do we respond to this? Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, if it is known that certain things we say have a particular benefit and a particular, uh, a particular use and a particular proven benefit, then what do you think of the speech of the Lord of the worlds? If you can go to a sick person and say, you know, keep your hopes up, keep your spirits up, be strong, and that can have a benefit on the body of the person, then what do you think about the speech of Ar-Rahman, the speech of Rabbul Alameen? This has an even greater benefit and the two are not comparable. Laysa kamithlihi shay. There's nothing similar to him. It's not comparable. 
But subhanAllah, if we can see in the speech of mankind what brings a cure, then how is it that we can't accept that there is a cure in the speech of the Lord of the worlds? The one who the virtue of his speech over the virtue of the others is the virtue of him over the virtue of his creation. And which is the perfect cure and the only beneficial means of protection and a guiding light and a general mercy. And if it was sent upon a mountain, it would render it asunder from his greatness and glory. And he mentions again that when they say from the Quran, they don't mean a part of the Quran. So the first rule that we're going to take in Rukia for ourselves here is we are going to talk that and, and mention a principle that Rukia, whatever you recite of the Quran is a Shifa. Now, we're going to divide effectively uh, what we recite from the Quran into three or so categories. We're going to divide it into those things which the Prophet wasallam recited to cure. And these are the most deserving things of being recited. And we're going to come across some of the hadith, but if we want to jot these down and just get some ideas, we have Surah Al-Fatiha. And it's mentioned in some of the hadith that Surah Al-Fatiha would be read seven times or three times. And we're going to cover these hadith insha'Allah ta'ala. From the ayat that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions were approved of and were mentioned about the virtue of them and the virtue of them against uh, the kind of illnesses that we're trying to combat is Ayatul Kursi. From them is the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah, Aman al-Rasul, which the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever recites them it will suffice him against everything. And from the greatest of them and the most beneficial and the one you should never, ever, ever leave, not for any reason, are the last three surahs of the Qur'an. Why? Because Al-Falaq and Al-Nas were revealed for the specific purpose of protection and Ruqya. The specific purpose of protection and ruqya. And the last we're going to add is Surah Al-Baqarah because the Prophet wasallam said Surah Al-Baqarah, taking it, i.e. learning it and memorizing it is barakah. And reading it is barakah. And abandoning it is loss. وَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُهَا الْبَطَرَةِ And in another riwayah, وَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُهَا السَّحَرَةِ The magicians or those who seek to discreate corruption on the earth, they are unable to stand in front of this surah. When this surah is recited, the magician falls to dust. The magician has nothing against this surah. So we have these ayat and these are hadith and there are many others we're going to mention. But the first category are those ayat and those hadith and those dua as well, those ad'iyah, those duas that the Prophet ﷺ said or approved of. So we're going to focus upon them and make them the asal, make them the foundation by which we perform our ruqya. Now the whole of the Qur'an is shifa. There are many ayat that are amazing in their ability for shifa. The ayat of sihr, the ayat of ayn, the ayat of illness, the ayat of tawakkul, the ayat of sakina, the ayat of many, many ayat. And alhamdulillah, the whole of the Qur'an is shifa and the issue is expansive. You have your option to read whatever you wish. But focus first and foremost upon those ayat which the Prophet wasallam would recite or which he would have recited on him or which he approved of reciting or which he gave a particular benefit for in reciting. Like saying that whoever reads the last two ayat of Al-Baqarah, he will be sufficed against every evil. And the one who seeks refuge with Allah Azza wa Jal with the uh, the last two surahs of the Quran or we can add Qul Hu Allahu Ahad and say the last three surahs of the Quran he will be protected against every evil or nothing will harm him for the day and the night and so on and so forth and those duas and those adhkar that are known to protect you and that are known to be used in ruqya the Prophet said Adhibil ba'sa rabban nas or make the illness go away Lord of the mankind washfi wa anta shafi or ishfi wa anta shafi. Cure and you are the one who cures. Shifa and la yughadiru saqama. A cure that leaves no illness. This is just an example of one of the things that's authentically mentioned. So if someone says, if you read, you know, read la ilaha illallah, read uh, this ayah. Mashallah, these are wonderful things to read. 
And this is you're affirming your tawheed and your trust in Allah and all of it is shifa. But you're going to focus before everything else on the ayat and the ad'iyah, the du'as that are authentically narrated from the Prophet ﷺ and his companions because these were revealed for a reason and the Prophet ﷺ is going to show you that which is best. And from the sad things that we see is that some of the ruqa when they recite, they never recite al-falaq and al-nas. They spend their whole time and they recite every single thing other than al-falaq and al-nas. And subhanAllah, this is something I noticed in my own recitation that I would be reciting as safat and Al-Jinn and MashaAllah, what wonderful surahs they are. And Yaseen and I would be reciting uh, the ayat from Yunus and the ayat from Taha and MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, what amazing ayat they are. But I would find that I would run out of time and I would have left Al-Falaq and Al-Nas to the very end. The two surahs that were sent down for the purpose of removing magic that were sent down and revealed specifically for removing magic. And I would be leaving them and sometimes running out of time. So my advice to you is, you begin and you focus with those ayat that were narrated in the sunnah, and then from there on you move out into the ayat that have a benefit, from the ayat that have a benefit of the ayat that talk about magic. The ayat that talk about how Allah destroys it. And you will find these in the Quran, and we mentioned perhaps some of them uh, in a moment. The ayat that relate to magic, the ayat that relate to Allah Azza wa Jal curing you, the ayat that relate to the Quran being shifa, the ayat that give your heart, make your heart tremble, the ayat that strike fear into your enemies. All of these ayat are beneficial in Rukya. Whatever you were to read in Rukya would be beneficial. And so we divided it three categories. Number one, those ayat and ahadith that are narrated from the Prophet ﷺ directly in the topic of Rukya. Number two, those that have a relationship or a link to the topic. So the ayat that relate to finding tranquility, sakina, the ayat that relate to sihr, the ayat that relate to the jinn, the ayat that relates to uh, finding a uh, cure in the Quran, the ayat that relate to the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ayat that relate to Allah giving his help over his enemies. This is in the second category. And in the third category, whatever you wish to recite from the Quran is shifa. So we divided it, those that are authentically narrated, those that have a clear link to the topic, those that, or those that are particularly of you know, particularly strike your heart and particularly cause you to, uh, to, to remember Allah Azza wa Jal and to remember the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over his enemies. And then the third category is whatever you wish to recite from the Quran. And my advice is that you, if you wish to do so, and Allah Azza wa Jal uh, knows best, and every Raqi has his methodology, that you begin with the ayat that, relate, that are narrated from the sunnah directly and then you move on to the ayat that have a relationship to the topic and then you recite whatever you wish from the Quran. Sometimes I will just come and I'll say, I want to recite Surah Al-Anbiya because I just want to recall the dua that those prophets made when Ayyub said what he said and when Yunus said what he said and Ayyub said that, oh my Lord, I've been touched by affliction and nobody can remove it except and you are the most merciful of those who have shown mercy. And when Yunus called out to his Lord and he said, that I have oppressed myself with a severe oppression and if you don't forgive me and have mercy on me. These ayat are not necessarily ayat of ruqya as, as in you may not find them in a ruqya book but they may give you something in your heart and your iman that will benefit you in a reminder and a reminder to yourself and a reminder to the jinn as well. And there's no harm in any part of the Quran that you read. So sometimes people are a little too strict and they'll say, you know, let me see what I have to read. Do I? You may read whatever you wish. And someone may say, I don't know Al-Baqarah, what can I do? Read whatever else you wish. Read whatever you can read that is easy for you because the whole Quran is Shifa. Let us look at some of the ahadith from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ regarding Ruqya and seeking a cure from the Quran. We've already heard the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri uh, regarding uh, what would make you know that it was Ruqya. And he's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in one narration, he said, you did the right thing. He said, you did the right thing. So this is an appro a clear approval from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the performance of Ruqya and a clear permission of the performance of Ruqya for non-Muslims. Clear? Ruqya, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approved it and he approved of Ruqya for non-Muslims. As you develop yourself in Ruqya, you may find that non-Muslims come and ask you for Ruqya. 
Give them da'wah first of all because your job is a da'iyah before it's a raqi. A raqi before everything else is a da'iyah, a caller to Allah Azza wa Jal. And tell them why they are going to be cured bi idnillah by this Qur'an. Recite over them, give them some of the things that we're going to teach you in, in the performance of the ruqya. And in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, the most deserving thing for which you take a wage is the Book of Allah. So in this we see the effect of the ruqya on the sick person. We see the approval of the Prophet ﷺ. We see the statement of the Prophet ﷺ that you did the right thing. And we see the Prophet ﷺ took a share of the wealth. And the Prophet ﷺ only takes the most pure of wealth. Remember this. The Prophet ﷺ would not have taken a share of any wealth that had impurity. And of course, Abu Sa'id originally, his action of performing the ruqya is an indication that the companions knew that ruqya was something uh, to be done. And we have the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, the most deserving thing that you take a wage for is the Book of Allah. And we have another narration in which the Prophet ﷺ said, take it from them. Take it from them. And this shows it's not an isolated circumstance. It's not a one-off. Take it from them, i.e. take it from, if it happens again, take it. Don't worry about taking it. The laughter of the Prophet ﷺ, the smiling of the Prophet ﷺ when he heard the story. And the fact that the other companions knew what Abu Sa'id was doing. A man stood up from among us and we did not think he knew how to perform ruqya. So they see here that the companions knew of it and there was a consensus amongst them for the permissibility of ruqya in this hadith. Ibn al-Qayyim said after mentioning this hadith, what do you think about Fatiha al-Kitab? What do you think about Surah al-Fatiha? Of which nothing has been revealed like it in the Quran or the Torah or the Injil or the Zabur. There is nothing in this Quran or in the Torah or in the Injil or the Zabur that is like it. It contains all of the meaning of the books of Allah. All of the scriptures of Allah are contained within it. And the mention of the fundamental principles of the names of Allah Ar-Rabb and Ar-Rahman. And it affirms life after death. And it mentions that Tawheed al-Rububiyyah and Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. And it mentions our desperate need of our Lord, glory be to Him, in seeking help and guidance. And that He is the only one that can do so. And it mentions the best dua and the most beneficial of dua and the most obligatory of duas to mention. And it mentions that which the slaves of Allah are most in need of, guidance to the straight path and that which contains the most complete knowledge of Him, His Tawheed and His worship by doing what He commanded and avoiding what he prohibited and remaining firm upon that until death. Just as it contains the mention of creation and their division into those who Allah has bestowed his favor upon, knowing the truth and acting upon it, loving it and spreading it, and those whom Allah is angry with for turning away from the truth after having known it, and the misguided one who does not know the truth at all. Just as it contains the mention of the affirmation of Qadr, the Sharia, the Day of Judgment, Prophethood, the purification of the soul and the correction of the heart, along with the justice of Allah and his bestowing good and the refutation of all of the people people of bid'ah and falsehood. In summary, Al-Fatiha encompasses servitude to Allah alone, praising Him, trusting in Him completely, seeking His help and relying upon Him, asking Him for comprehensive blessings, the guidance which brings blessings and keeps away punishment, and all of this is from the greatest of medicines. I sometimes read this from time to time to remind me just what Surah Al-Fatiha is. This is Surah Al-Fatiha. And this is what Ibn Qayyim says about Surah Al-Fatiha. So don't make Surah Al-Fatiha something small. This Surah Al-Fatiha, this is what it is. SubhanAllah, it contains every meaning that exists in the Quran and the Torah, in the Injil and the Zabur, in this small place. We're going to come across another hadith. A hadith narrated by Imam Ahmad and Abu Dawood and Nasai. From Kharija ibn al-Sal from his paternal uncle, that we came to the Prophet Sallallahu when we came to a tribe from the Arabs. They said, we've been informed you have come to this man with good, so do you have a medicine or a ruqya? Because we have a man suffering from madness. We said, yes. They brought the one afflicted with insanity. I read Al-Fatiha for three days, morning and evening, at the beginning and the end of the day. And I would blow with my spit, and it was as though he was released from chains. They gave me a wage, and I said, no, not until I asked the Prophet 
and he said, eat it, devour this wage, for by my, the one whose hand my life is in, whoever takes money for a false ruqya, or that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned a punishment for the one who takes money for a false ruqya, and he says, but you have taken money for a true ruqya. And this is a different occasion to the occasion of the previous example of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an. This contains the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha, the approval of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu saying, you have devoured wealth from a true ruqya, you have eaten wealth from a true ruqya. In the fourth hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim and Imam Ahmad and, and the Muwatta of Imam Malik, the Sunan of Abu Dawood and Nasa'i and Ibn Majah, that the Prophet ﷺ used to, when he was ill, blow on himself with al-mu'awwidat, with uh, al-falaq and al-nas, and qul huwa Allahu ahad, and wipe over his body with his hand. When he became ill in the sickness which led to his death, Aisha radiallahu anha said, I would blow on him with the mu'awwidat that he used to read and I would use the hand of the Prophet sallallahu to wipe him with in another narration because it was greater in barakah than my, than my hand. In another narration and he used to do this to his family. The Prophet sallallahu used to perform ruqya in this way to his family. Look at how this encompasses the benefits of the Rukia and the importance of the Rukia and the fact that the Prophet ﷺ would recite Rukia for his family in this way. The hadith of Sahih ibn Hibban from Aisha radiallahu anha that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ entered while a woman was treating her or performing Rukia and he said, treat her with the book of Allah. Treat her with the book of Allah. So perhaps this woman is reading one of the Ruqa, the Ruqya that was from the time of Jahiliya, and it didn't contain any shirk. But the Prophet ﷺ guided Aisha and the woman to what is better. So he said, when he guided the woman to what is better, he said, what you're doing is fine, it doesn't contain shirk. Because if it contains shirk, Aisha radiallahu anha would have stopped her. But he said, treat her with the book of Allah. It's better for you to use the Quran than to use the other things that you were using before. In a hadith in the Sahih of Imam Muslim and the Sunan of Abi Dawood, Ibn Hibban al-Tabarani and others, including Al-Bayhaqi from Awf, Ibn Malik, Al-Ashja'i, we used to perform ruqya in the pre-Islamic time of ignorance and the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, show me your ruqya for there is no harm in a ruqya as long as it does not contain shirk. If the Prophet وسلم, allowed ruqya that doesn't contain shirk from outside of the Quran, this shows us what? That the Quran is more deserving of ruqya than those things. Because if they are allowed, then the Quran is allowed, what, like we say in Arabic, min babi awla. From them, it's even more deserving of being allowed. And of course, there are three conditions for this about upon which there is ijma' that it be from Allah's speech, names and attributes, that it be in Arabic. So the first thing is that the ruqya be from Allah's speech, his names and his attributes and the mention of Allah. Upon this there is ijma' and I think it is Ibn al-Qayyim or some of the other ulama that they mention the ijma' al-ulama Fath al-Bari, al-Hafid ibn Hajar mentions the ijma' in Fath al-Bari and Sharh al-Nawawi ala Sahih Muslim, the explanation of al-Nawawi and Fath al-Majid, the explanation of Kitab al-Tawheed and Ma'arij al-Qabul by Hafid al-Hakami. All of them mention the ijma' that there are three conditions for this ruqya to be accepted in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. One, that it is from Allah's speech and names and attributes, the mention of Allah, the remembrance of Allah. One is that it be in Arabic or what is clearly understood in another language. One, the belief that the ruqya alone does not benefit without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hadith in Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Jabir radiallahu an, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa allowed ruqya for a snake bite in Bani Amr ibn Hazm and Abu Zubair the narrator said, I heard Jabir say, a man from among us was stung by a scorpion when we were sitting with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a man said, O oh, messenger of Allah, should I perform ruqya? He said, whoever is able to help his brother, let him do so. In another wording, Jabir said, I had a maternal uncle who performed ruqya on those people who were stung by scorpions and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had, in, had forbidden these ruqya and he came to him and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you've forbidden incantations and I use ruqya to treat those stung by scorpions. The Prophet said, whoever of you is able to help his brother, let him do so. Look at the general wording, Ya Ikhwan. 
He didn't say yes. If he'd said yes, we would have limited Rukia to scorpion stings. He kept it completely general and he gave the Mustafti, the one who was asking him, he gave him more than he needed. He said, whoever is able to help his brother, let him do so. This is the encouragement of the Prophet ﷺ for you to be a Raqi, for you to treat the people with Rukia. So now we come to the methods of Rukia bi idnillahi ta'ala. From the methods of Rukia, and we're going to mention approximately 10 methods of Rukia, each one of them has some evidence for it from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The first is reading alone. Reading without blowing, without touching, without coming near to the person, simply reciting the Qur'an. And from the things that the Prophet ﷺ used to read, Cause the illness to go, Lord of mankind, and cure, you are the curer, a cure which, there is no cure but your cure, a cure which leaves no illness. And from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, In the name of Allah, Allah will make you free of this illness. مِن كُلِّ دَاءٍ يَشْفِيك مِن كُلِّ دَاءٍ يَشْفِيك And he will cure you from every sickness. وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدْ And from the evil of the uh, hasid, the uh, jealous person, if he is jealous. وَمِن شَرِّ كُلِّ ذِي عَيْنٍ And from every, the evil of everyone who gives ayn. And in this hadith, it can also be potentially understood the difference in we said between ayn and hasad. From the things the Prophet ﷺ used to say, Bismillahi arqeek, min kulli shay'in yu'dhik, wa min sharri kulli nafsin aw aynin hasidin illahu yashfeek, Bismillahi arqeek. In the name of Allah, I perform ruqya upon you, from everything that is harming you, and from every person, or from every person, or from every envious eye, may Allah cure you from it. In the name of Allah, I perform ruqya upon you. From the methods that is narrated in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ of Rukia is to read and to blow. To read and to blow. So you recite the Quran and you blow the Quran over. And in this is the hadith of Aisha, which is found in the Sunan of Imam al Nasai and Ibn Majah and in the, uh, the book of Ibn Abi Shaybah from Aisha radiallahu anha that the Prophet ﷺ used to blow when he performed Rukia. And in a hadith in which Al-Bukhari and Muslim agree from Aisha that the Prophet ﷺ, if he was sick, he would read into his, by himself or into his palms, the Mu'awwidat, the last two surahs or the last three surahs of the Qur'an, and he would blow. So this is blowing without spittle. From the third method of Ruqya, we're going to come to it, inshaAllah. From the third method of Ruqya, inshaAllah, narrated in the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is ruqya and spitting upon the person. As in, and blowings with forcefully with some of the spittle coming out. In this we have the hadith of Abi Sa'id. And this hadith has been previously mentioned. And he began to recite Al-Fatiha and he, he gathered his spit together and he spat into the wound. And the Prophet وسلم, approved of this. From the hadith is the hadith of Imam Ahmad and Abu Dawood and Al-Nasai from Kharija ibn al-Salt from his uncle and we mentioned this hadith about the madness and again about how he would recite Al-Fatiha and he would spit. In the third hadith of Ahmad and Al-Nasai and Ibn Abi Shayba and Al-Tabarani from Muhammad ibn Hatib that he said that uh, something happened to me from Qadr, something uh, afflicted me and he said that he went uh, to something afflicted his hands and his hands were uh, they were they became burnt so he went to uh, he went or his father took him to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam read and then he said uh, cure and you are the one who brings uh, the cure and again we have in this uh, hadith a mention in some of the narrations of the spittle we have reading and wiping. So this is reading and wiping. Reading and wiping over a person. In this we have what is narrated Bukhari and Muslim from Aisha. That the Prophet ﷺ used to read Rukia over some of his family and he would wipe with his right hand. 
And in another narration that the Prophet ﷺ would say, O oh Allah, Lord of, the, o Lord of the people, cause the illness to go and cure. You are the cure. There is no cure except your cure and a cure that leaves no illness. And he would wipe with his right hand. From this is the hadith of Imam Ahmad and Tabarani and Ibn Hibban and Tahawi and others. That they said that one of the companions said, Talq ibn Ali, that I was stung by a scorpion uh, when I was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he read Rukia upon me and he wiped me with his hand. And there are several other ahadith. From this is the reading and placing the hand upon the person. Reading and placing the hand upon the person. Ya ikhwan, notice how these are different forms of Rukia. You don't always have to put the hand on the person. It is one form of Rukia. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would do it and sometimes he would not do it. This is going to benefit you when we come to talking about giving Rukia upon women. For those people who say it's a necessity for me to put my hand. We say there are so many narrations when the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba perform Rukia without putting their hand. Yet there are narrations when they put their hand. Reading and placing it on the place of pain. In Sahih al-Bukhari Abu Dawood from Aisha radiallahu from Aisha binti Sa'ad radiallahu anha that her father said that I was uh, I complained of an illness in Makkah so the Prophet I came to the Prophet sallallahu or the Prophet sallallahu came to me to visit me when I was sick and he put his hand upon the place of pain then he wiped over my chest and my stomach and he said Allahumma shfi Sa'adan Allahumma shfi Sa'adan Sa'adan wa atmim lahu hijrata O Allah cure Sa'ad and make allow him to complete his hijrah so the prophet ﷺ put his hand on his i think he said he put it on his cheek and he put it on his chest and he put it on his stomach so he's putting his hand over the place of pain and reciting this is from the beneficial forms of ruqya that you will do as a raqi but you must remember like we said it's not the only form of ruqya so from the beneficial forms of ruqya is that you follow the pain in the body with your hand and it's also narrated from Uthman ibn Abil As al Thaqafi that he uh, was complained of an illness to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and something that he pain he found in the, his body since the time that he became Muslim. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Put your hand on the place of pain in your body, then say Bismillah three times and say seven times, "A'udhu billahi wa qudratihi min sharri ma ajidu wa uhadir." I seek refuge with Allah and His power from the evil of everything that I find and everything that I fear. And the Prophet ﷺ said in another narration, according to Imam al-Nasai, put your right hand on the place of pain and wipe over it seven times and say, أعوذ بعزة الله وقدرته من شر ما أجد وكل مسحة or في كل مسحة in every single time that you wipe over, say, so you're wiping over the pain and saying, I seek the refuge with the izza of Allah and His power from everything that I find. From the sixth form of Rukia that is mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is reading and blowing and wiping the hand. So reading, blowing and wiping. Reading, blowing and wiping. And we've seen the hadith before, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, reading, blowing and wiping. This is from the beneficial forms of Rukia that you can do for yourself and for others. From the forms of Rukia is reading, spitting onto the finger. Touching the earth and touching the sick person. Some of the ulama, they limited this for the, uh, the uh, they limited it to the earth of Medina. They limited it to the earth of Medina. And it's narrated that uh, in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim from Aisha radiallahu anha, that the messenger of Allah sallallahu if a person would come to him complaining of a sickness or he had a wound or an illness, he would go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi would go with his hand like this. And he put his, he put his uh, index finger on the earth. Then he took his index finger up and he said, Bismillah, the earth of our land, Turba to Ardina, the earth of our land, Biriqati Ba'dina, with the spit of some of us. And then he would say, Liyushfa bihi saqimana, or Liyushfa bihi saqimuna bi idni rabbina, to cure our sick with the permission of our Lord. So he would say, Some of our earth and some of our spittle to cure the sick with the permission of our Lord. And Ibn al-Qayyim and al-Nawawi said, the majority of the ulama say that the earth here is any earth 
and some of them said it was only the earth of Medina but Al Ibn Qayyim and Al Nawawi they give the correct opinion that the majority say that it is any earth and Ibn Al Qayyim said Qultu wal -adhiru wal -adharu qawlu jumhur, and it is most apparent that the hadith is referring to any earth that you use that sand, dirt and you touch it and spit onto the finger and to touch the person uh, to recite, to spit onto the finger after reciting, to touch the earth and to touch the person and to say this dua with some of our earth and some of our spittle we cure our sick person with the permission of our Lord. From the methods of Rukia that is narrated from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is to put salt in water and put it on the place of pain while reading and this is specific to the one that is bitten by a snake or a scorpion by a snake or by a scorpion so again we have a hadith in which the messenger of Allah وسلم, on a certain night was praying and he put his hand on the earth and it was bitten by a scorpion and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed this particular thing and he said May Allah curse the scorpion that it does not leave the one who is praying nor anyone else. And then he called for some salt and water and he put the salt in the water and he put it together uh, in a container and then he began to pour it over his finger where it was uh, stung and to wipe over it and he began to read what? Al-Falaq and Al-Nas al muawwidatain Al-Falaq and Anas, and this hadith we said is in uh, Ibn Abi Shayba and Al Tabarani and Abu Naim and Al Bayhaqi from the hadith of Ali radiallahu an. So we have here another example of a different form of ruqya for the scorpion sting uh, and the snake bite. The ninth form of ruqya that we have is reading, mixing earth and water, blowing on it, and pouring it over the sick. So this is reading over water, sometimes the water would have earth mixed into it, blowing on it and pouring it over the sick person. This is in a hadith of Abu Dawood and Al-Nasai and Al-Bukhari in Al-Tariq Al-Kabir and Al-Tabarani from the hadith of Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu entered upon him and he was sick and he said Akshifil ba'sa rabban nas another wording may you remove the sickness lord of the mankind and then Thabit ibn Qais said then he took some earth from Bathan and he put it into a pot then he began to blow over the water and he poured it over me Ibn Hibban declared this hadith to be sahih and Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz in Majmu' al Fatawa said it is Hassan al Isnad, it has a fair chain of narration. The tenth method, and this is the method that is something that is a matter of disagreement amongst the ulama, is to write something from the Quran and to put it into the water until it dissolves and to drink or bathe in it. And we said, yani, it is better for you to, as the Prophet ﷺ said, da'ma yuribuk lima la yuribuk. So leave the writing of the Quran and the putting it into water. And some of the ulama from the Salaf did this, so we're not going to come down on it like a ton of bricks. It's not a ta'weev. They would write the Quran in saffron or a saffron ink and simply dip it into the water and drink it. The problem is that this opens a door for the magicians because many people will not be able to distinguish between what is the Quran and what is not the Quran. And furthermore, yani if there is, some, there is no evidence from the Prophet وسلم, uh, specifically, those who said it was permissible, they said that all of the Quran is Shifa, many of the Salaf did so, and there is a general permissibility for Rukia. Uh, but my advice to you guys is that in order to make it clear for the people that the 10th method, we leave this. Uh, and from those who allowed it are Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah and ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. This completes a good chunk of our introduction to Rukia and the methods of Rukia. We should at this point I think mention uh, of great importance to us is for us to talk about the use of water and olive oil. The use of water and olive oil. There are many, many things that you can use in Rukia and we're going to talk about those in a separate module later on called supplementary or alternative uh, or su supplementary uh, things that you can use in Rukia. But two things that almost every Raqi will be using day in, day out are water and olive oil. As for the water, Water is of three kinds in terms of its virtue. The most virtuous of water is 
Zamzam. After Zamzam, the most virtuous of water, it appears in the Quran to be rain water. Because Allah Azza wa Jal mentions its barakah and how the Prophet Sallallahu in the Sunnah used to uncover part of his thobe to let the rain brush over him and he would say, Innahu hadithu ahdin bi Rabbi. It's close, it's been close to its Lord. It's come from close to Allah Azza wa Jal. So the rain water, it has a degree of barakah in it. I don't want you to get too hung up over these things. If I don't have zamzam, if I don't have this. But yeah, and if you have a person outside and it starts to rain, you can follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Take your, uncover yourself, your jacket, and allow a little bit of the rain water to wash over you because it is near, it has come from near its Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. The use of olive oil. The Prophet ﷺ used to wipe in ruqya. We don't have the blessedness of his hand sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What we have that is blessed is the tree of the olive. Allah Azza wa Jal describes it as being blessed. And when I say for you to use olive oil, I'm going to talk about this in the last uh, presentation. I recommend that you use good quality, uh, cold pressed, extra virgin olive oil, the real stuff, not watered down cooking oil or something like that. And again, you can feel free to recite over it, to blow over it as is indicated in this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we mentioned of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi blowing over the water that had some earth mixed into it and you may blow over that as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to blow over his hands and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has in an authentic hadith it is from a blessed tree so anoint yourselves with it or as he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam anoint yourselves with it as in rub yourselves with it so two things that Iraqi is going to have with him for a great amount of time are going to be water that has been recited upon and olive oil that is being recited upon and you don't need it because you have alhamdulillah the quran and that's sufficient for you but this is an extra thing the prophet ﷺ recommended people to anoint themselves with olive oil to wipe olive oil over themselves he mentioned that it has a lot of barakah it's a blessed tree and likewise the zamzam is for whatever it is drunk for and there is a benefit in all of the water which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the quran that allah gives life after to the dead after or, or to a dead earth after it comes to it and so on and so forth so this is just